The Council of Nicaea would initiate a period known as the Great Golden Age of Theology, a time period spanning from 325 to 451. However, contrary to the name, the Golden Age was anything but golden, but in fact rife with conflict. In fact, some of the biggest and most significant conflicts the church would face, theologically speaking, would come about during this period. Nevertheless, such conflict would serve as the crucible for some of the richest theology the church would produce. And it is this period, the golden age of theology, that we are going to be examining for the remainder of this series. Well, the conflict that really kick-started this period was over a theology known as Arianism, a name deriving its origin not from some fancy Greek theological term, but rather after a presbyter by the name of Arius, who lived and taught in the early years of the 4th century. Well, the whole conflict began during a gathering of church leaders in Alexandria, and during that meeting, the bishop of that city was giving a sermon on the relationship between God the Father and his son, Christ Jesus. Well, upon finishing his sermon, Arius made the statement, Perhaps there once was a time when the son was not, well, little did he anticipate that it was this proclamation that would serve as the spark igniting perhaps one of the greatest conflicts in the church's history. Well, sometime later, this same bishop of Alexandria called the council to address this issue, resulting in the expulsion of Arius. Now, by this point, Arius' teaching had already begun to have a strong influence on a significant number so much so that it inevitably reached the ears of the Roman emperor. Now, why this is significant is that this particular emperor by the name of Constantine had just a few years earlier come to accept the Christian faith. And so when he got news of this conflict, felt the need to intervene. Now, we must understand that as emperor, perhaps Constantine understood that a divided church could inevitably result in a divided empire. And so he convened what would be known as the first ecumenical council in church history, Nicaea. Now, the Council of Nicaea was certainly not the first council in the church's history. As was mentioned in a previous video, councils go all the way back to the first century. Rather, Nicaea was unique in that it extended to all church leaders throughout the entire Christian world. In fact, this is what the word ecumenical means, global or worldwide. That is, extending to all Christians throughout the entire world. So then, what exactly was it that Arius was promoting that was creating such a stir in the church? Well, to help us understand the teaching of Arianism, we need to first understand it in relation to many of its predecessors. Now, if we were to liken the relationship between each of the Christological heresies to feuding family trees, then we would essentially have two main family lines running parallel to one another. So on the one side, we would have the Ebionite family line starting off with Ebionism inevitably giving birth to Adoptionism, and Adoptionism later giving birth to Arianism. And on the other side, we would have the family tree of the Docetists, who in their earliest years give birth to a philosophy known as Gnosticism, which later breaks off from Christianity, and in their later years to modalism. Think of these two like the Montagues and the Capulets in the early church. And it's really in the context of these two family lines that we can truly and more fully understand Arianism. Now, part of understanding Arianism involves first understanding it within the context of its own family line. That is, what exactly differentiates Arianism from its predecessors. Now, what all three of these teachings have in common is that they all equally upheld the full humanity of Christ. There was really no debates amongst them on this matter. Where they differed, however, was with regard to how they understood Jesus' divinity. Well, to briefly recap, the Ebionites believed Jesus was fully human and in no respect divine. Even anything remotely resembling divinity was completely rejected by them. The Adoptionists, however, would agree with the Ebionites in saying that Jesus was fully human, 
but then would add that Jesus, while not divine by nature, became divine later on. However, he was not, nor would ever become divine, like the Father was divine. And finally, the Arians would agree with both camps in affirming Jesus' humanity, and proceed to agree with the adoptionists in affirming a divinity different from that of the Father. However, where these two groups would part company was over when and what degree Jesus was divine. For according to Arianism, Christ was divine not from his baptism, but from before the world began. And therefore, being divine from before the creation of the world possessed a degree of divinity far exceeding the divinity of the adoptionist's understanding of Jesus. Now, there are many who would say that Arianism really is a later form of adoptionism, similar to how adoptionism could be considered a form of Ebionism, being that they all come from the same general family line. In other words, Arianism could be considered high-octane adoptionism. Nevertheless, despite this high view of Christ's divinity, it is nevertheless a divinity that differs greatly from that of the divinity ascribed to the Father. Now, to understand this difference, we need to first examine one fundamental dimension of being. When we speak of the nature of a being, any being for that matter, we can categorize it into one of two main categories. Those things which have a beginning, and those things which have no beginning. Those things which have a beginning we call temporal, and those things which have no beginning we call eternal. And there is no in-between. That is, you can't be half eternal and half temporal. You either have a beginning or you don't. Simply because there are some truths that are along a spectrum, and there are some truths that are one or the other. Case in point with this latter example being life and death. That is, you are either alive or dead. You can't be half dead and half alive. Now, some people have been described as half-dead, but really what they mean when they say this is that the person is in all actuality alive, but in such a bad state of affairs that they are closely approaching death. And in very similar fashion, all things fall into the category of either eternal or temporal. Now, very few within the early church would dispute the temporal nature of the universe on the one hand, or the eternality of the Father on the other. The biggest question was over where one placed the Son, on the side of eternality or on the side of temporality. Well, the Arians believed that before anything existed, there was God. However, when the Arians spoke of God, they meant so with reference to the Father alone. The Father then created the Son, and through the Son, the universe. That is, while the Son existed before time began, he did not, however, exist from time eternal with the Father. That is, as Arius once said, there once was a time when the Son was not, thus placing him on the side of temporality. Therefore, because the Son is a created being, he was therefore regarded by Arians as being an entirely different being from that of the Father. And the oneness he shared was not a oneness of being, but rather a oneness of will, that is, in fulfilling the plan of God the Father in the world. Now, to really understand the drive behind Arius' teaching, that is, why he emphasized such a strong divide between the Father and the Son, involves understanding it not only within its own family line, but also in relation to the docetic line of teaching. And as we discussed in a previous video, part of understanding any view involves understanding it within its polemical context. Well, in this regard, Arianism is no different. Well, specifically, much of the doctrine found in Arianism is in fact a polemical response against modalism. Case in point was their respective understanding over the relationship between the Father and the Son. Now, as a side point, it needs to be briefly mentioned that our failure to mention the Holy Spirit thus far is not due to his lack of importance in the Godhead, 
nor because the early church believed such to be true, but rather because the focus throughout much of the 3rd and early 4th centuries was more concerned over the relationship specifically between the Father and the Son. Now, as we mentioned in the previous video, modalism is the belief that God, while one being, manifests himself in various forms or modes of one and the same person. Similar to how one and the same actor acts out various roles via different masks. That is, father and son are merely one person. Well, the word used to describe these different masks was prosopon. In fact, perhaps one of the most prominent modalists, an early 3rd century church leader by the name of Sibelius, used a word to refer to this oneness of God, hamausia, meaning one substance or being. Hence, for Sibelius, as well as for many other modalists like him, God was one ousia, consisting of three prosopon, as interpreted in the sense of three masks. And it is in reaction to these terms and the meaning behind them that Arianism can be more properly understood. And so in reaction to this belief, Arianism goes to the other extreme by claiming that rather than father and son being two modes or prosopons of the one true God, the father and the son are two entirely separate beings. And therefore, rather than hamausia, Arius himself defined the relationship between the father and the son to be heterousia, that is, of a different substance or being. Moreover, in place of prosopon, Arius preferred using the term hypostasis, which emphasized an even greater difference between the two. For according to Arius, the father and the son were not just two distinct persons, but also two separate beings containing their own separate foundations of being. That is, Arianism is just one more example of this conflict between the Docetic and Ebionite lines. The only significant difference being that Arianism grants a higher divine status to the Son than any previous Ebionite doctrine. Hence, according to Arianism, God is three hypostasi, with God the Father being the only true divine hypostasis. And so it is within this context, that is within the context of these two extremes, Arianism and Sibelianism, modalism, that is going to shape much of the theological discussion of the 4th century. Well, the church is going to respond negatively to Arianism by rejecting Arius' view of father and son as two separate hypostasy beings. However, to do this, required the use of an aforementioned term, hamausia. Now remember, this term hamausia is the exact same term used by Sibelius, bearing modalistic connotations. And so to get the feel of how this would have been heard by many attending bishops would be very similar to how terms such as Marxism or perhaps even fascism would sound to people today. And therefore, due to the negative connotation attached to this term, there are many within the church that are going to take issue with the Nicene Creed. And so, unsurprisingly, while the Council of Nicaea would spell the death blow to Arianism, within the Roman Empire at least, its results would inevitably bring more conflict for the church extending far into the 4th century. And it is this conflict and the subsequent effects it had on the church throughout much of the 4th century that we shall be discussing more in depth in the following video. I invite all questions and comments in the discussion section, so please feel free to write or ask any questions below. Thanks.